Hey, welcome back to Filled with the Spirits. Uh, don't forget to like and subscribe. Ring that bell so that uh, Jason and I can have more opportunities to drink whiskey and talk to you about theology. Yeah, so. we would never drink whiskey if it wasn't for this podcast or talk theology. So please keep keep the dinging of the bell. That's right. Just remember, only you can stop us from drinking whiskey that's, by not. That's true. Like, <laughs> don't stop us, please. <laughs> All right. So uh, today... Uh, we have come to a distillery that uh, Jason and I both fancy. Um, I happened to give Jason a sample of Balvini 15, uh, what, about 18 months ago, two years ago? I'd say about 18 months ago. Balvini 15, right there. And uh, it, it quickly turned Jason from a uh, a bourbon and sometimes other whiskey guy into a scotch guy. Right? That's true. That, that, that's your entry, entryway right there. I had always hated scotch. And then I just, the thing is with scotch, there's just such a huge variety of it. Whereas with bourbon, there's not as much variety, right? So with scotch, I had tried one thing that I just hated. And it turns out there's more than just that one scotch that uh-huh. I had. <laughs> so you just had to find the right one. Right. Uh, that's here we are. Yep. And uh, so in deciding what, to, what whiskey to talk about today, um, I found... This uh, this is uh, the Balvini. It's uh, a Balvini twelve, but it's it's aged in virgin American oak. Uh, so, so while most of the time scotches are aged in bottle uh, in barrels that have already been used, this one is a new barrel. So so I I don't know that I've seen this bottle around before. Is this um, not a standard offering, or is it harder to come I, by? I'm or? not sure. I, I don't know that I've seen it around before either. I think it probably shows up uh, periodically and gets snatched up pretty quick. Yep. Um, so for those of you that don't know, um, the bourbon has to be aged in new oak, new American oak, in the United States uh, to be called bourbon. Yep. So um, most of the time, your scotches are going to be aged in barrels that were that are second use barrels, maybe even third use barrels. So it's kind of unique to get one that is aged in a new barrel. And that barrel happens to be American Oak. So I think we're both kind of excited to try this. Definitely. And, uh, should we try that one first? Yeah, I think so because we, because we can kind of measure it against, uh, besides, I think, I don't know about you, but I, I think, uh, I'm expecting the Balvini 15 to still be the best of these two. Yeah. So uh, we'll, we'll try the one that we think might be second best first. Way, way lighter. It's, it's sure. definitely way lighter. We'll we'll hold this up uh, when we get the Balvini 15 in there, but it's definitely way lighter than the Balvini 15. I'm guessing that's the sherry in the 15. Yeah, probably doing that. Well, and it's and it's aged longer. This is okay. only aged 12 years, so. Well, 12 years in a new barrel is a long time. For, so for bourbon, 12 years in a new barrel is right on the edge of too long but i wonder if that's the the climate maybe bigger swings up and down in kentucky as compared to scotland uh it, it could be i mean scotland's a much more temperate climate it smells great it smells great i smell a little bit of maltiness too which is which i really dig right now That's unlike anything I've had from Balvini. Right? I mean, I ex- I guess I expect a lot more sherry bombs. That's really good. It's um, it's really good. It's 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 a lot sweeter than I expected. It's kind of sweeter, kind of fruity. Um, yeah, yeah, sweeter, fruity. That's a good way to describe it. That's yeah. That's I mean, that's a good all around. I'd buy that all the time if I could find it. Of course, how, is that about a hundred bucks a bottle? No, no, bucks? no. It wasn't that much. Uh, I want to say it was like. Uh, it was pretty comparable to, um, they had the Balvini 12 and Balvini 14, the Balvini okay. 12 double wood and the Balvini 14, uh, Caribbean cask on the shelf. And it was, so it was more than the Balvini 12, but less than the Caribbean cask. Okay. So I, I don't know that if I've, I don't think I've had the Caribbean cask before. Oh, well, sorry. I that guess I didn't we should try that, that sometime. Then. Yeah. Yeah. We'll have to, I mean, I've had it before, um, and it, it's a great whiskey. Uh, I will say that I'm glad I chose this this time because I saw it and I thought, oh, this is unique. And so if nothing else, 
one of the purposes of this podcast gives Jason and I an excuse to try new whiskeys. It's true. And, uh, you know, Balvini, in fact, we would love to try all of your whiskeys on air on the podcast. Yep. So if you just go ahead and send us a case of everything That's you make. right. You know. And, in fact, we're even okay if you don't give us anything older than the Balvini 15. I mean, you're welcome to, but uh, we, we'd be happy with some of the younger Balvinis. So. That's true. Yeah, that's um, kind of malty, a little bit fruity. There's definitely a fruitness there to it. Hmm. Uh, it's almost real similar to an Irish whiskey in that way. I wanted to say that the yeah, I mean, so with we talked about this before, I think, but the, you know, Irish whiskeys make me think of like grass, kind of fields, like that. I don't know grass flavor and that sounds awful for people who who don't drink whiskey right. i'm sure but like that's what i think of and this has that to me but what was the you gave me a word that described it better than than grass yeah i'm sorry that was yeah. that was some time in the past so it was i, I yeah <laughs> it, it, it's almost organic earthy but but there's a, there's a real fruity crispness to yeah. it it's I, that green apple some of that yeah. stuff that I, you've had me taste before has like a Kind of a green apple crispiness, and I get that. I don't get that in the 15. I mean, we'll try it here in a second, but I, it's, yeah. it's been a little while since I've had it, but none of that at all. Like, it's it's a totally, like, if you're a bourbon person and you try these two things, they're going to, you're these are both scotches. And they're completely, completely different. different. Yeah, yeah, totally different. I mean, you can see just looking at them. Yeah, this is, this totally is almost flavor. a lighter taste to yep. it. It's not going to dominate your palate, uh, you know, like. Well, once we have the the fifteen, like in certain ways, it's really tough to cleanse your palate again because you, it's so rich, yeah. right? Th- I expect this to be a much richer, fuller tasting scotch, whereas this is almost light and airy and crisp and fruity. Uh, it's it's like they made an Irish whiskey in Scotland. I could see that. Like, so it's talk, great though. I mean, I love water it. Here. I, I love it a lot. I'm, I'm very happy that, that we chose this. So so 12 years in a new barrel, which, for again, for scotch is kind of uncommon. Um, it's not overly woody at all. No. Like if... I, if I, I think that's because of the climate in it's Scotland. It's got to be. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's... I mean, if this was... If this is 12 years, if they had shipped this to Kentucky or barreled it in Kentucky, I think we're talking about a darker, a, a more... Um, they call it barrel candy. That barrel candy taste, almost like candied apple instead of just green apple. Yep. Uh, but but in Scotland, the weather is so much more temperate. So a lot less, you know, like they don't even have air conditioning over there. Yeah. I've got a 12-year bourbon in the cabinet over here off camera. Much darker. I mean, not not quite this dark as the sherry, but much darker than that. Yeah. And like it's right on the edge of too much wood. Like another six months in the barrel. And, you're and like, you'd have been like, I'm done with yeah. it. Yeah. So, all right. Well, I'm gonna rinse this out and uh, and hit what I've kind of been craving the uh, balcony uh, fifteen. 15 there. Yep. So, so you may notice that Jason and I like to uh, I I like to chase my whiskey with water all the time. And you know, the great thing about whiskey is everybody likes to drink it their own way. The only thing I don't really like to do with whiskey is mix it. I, I'm not a big mix drink guy. So, I don't think I've ever had scotch mixed with anything i don't know that i would want to no no no. yeah i've I mean, had it on ice before well, I like it there are people that will have scotch and soda yep so that's a pretty common scotch and soda or scotch on the rocks scotch and soda is technically mixing i guess yep. but i mean i guess that's topo chico and yeah scotch that yeah there See, you I go i don't know i don't want that i want to no, taste no, no, i want no, to no. taste I, the whiskey that's right I, I want i want all of the flavor and then if i don't like the flavor i can i can drink some water and get rid of it yep. but i find like if I cleanse my palate each time with a little bit of water, then the next sip has all those bursting flavors again. It's yep. almost like tasting it. So new you're starting over with it. Yep. Yeah. Oh, you, you can darker. smell the wood, the richness, the cherry, the sherry smell, dark, dark berry. Kind yeah. Of. I mean, you, if, without looking at it, you can smell the the dark. Yeah, darkness. I mean, if you put these two side by side, you would say, well, one is younger than the other. 
but you would say it not because one is younger. You would say it because they, you know, this smells so much lighter yep. and fluffier, and this smells so much darker and stronger. And it's like um, the difference between a stout and a pilsner, you know, where you can oh, you that's can. A, that's a good example. So this is forty three percent alcohol by volume. My guess is this is about forty five. 47.8 so 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 it is stronger but oh man yep that's a good whiskey <laughs> i was about to say like that's the best scotch but we had something at that the whiskey festival we were at it was a balvini some crazy old balvini that I, I, was it a, the 25 it was something expensive and old i mean there were there was lots of There's good a lot scotches of, yeah. that I had that were expensive and old. So, uh, so I, this is within the realm of possibility of me owning a bottle. This is, is yeah. up there. It's yeah. As good so, as it gets. so the Balvini 15 Sherry Cask, you know, pre pandemic was running right at $100, uh, maybe 105, 110. I haven't actually bought one post pandemic my own. I, I think. I think you bought me one and I reimbursed you and I, yep. because I didn't pay for it myself, I, but I want to say it was like 120 ish. I think it was about 110, 115, but okay. it was more. All right. Yep. And so actually, it's a little bit more. I went a couple of weeks later, I was at that same store and they had one and I ended up, that's this one. Oh, I, ended, okay. I ended up buying one from the same place. All right. And so it was about the same price, yep. about 110 plus about tax. One, yeah. Yep. Okay. Well, so, so that gives you an idea. So this is, this is probably. 65 ish 70 ish depending on where you shop and this is this is 110 ish so so significant step up in price but i would also say a significant step up in flavor uh, yeah this, this is one of those bottles you don't want to have only one scotch in your cabinet and have it be this because then you'll, yeah, just, you'll, you'll drink, drink it through, way too you'll fast. drink it too quick yeah so i like to keep this and then like a, a glenn farkless 10 or something like that which is a much cheaper not as old sherry cask not as good either but it's like 40 bucks or something and for 40 bucks it's a great bottle oh yeah but this is this is the yeah, king. yeah i mean this is like uh you know th this is like oh you're at school and you get cupcakes yay and this is like wow you came home and your mom made a cheesecake just for you yep, <laughs> like that's, you that's the difference you still love cupcakes but oh, mom's homemade cheesecake is yep. so much better. So. And, and it may be worth mentioning again, uh, not knowing our audience, you could tell us who you are, and that would help us out a lot. But uh, you know, coming from bourbon myself, I think of scotch as oh, it tastes like a dirty band aid that's been in a fireplace, you know. And these do not have that flavor, right? These, these do not have that smokiness to them. There's no smoke. There's no peaty, no flavor. peatiness at all in, in these to me. So for those of you that don't know, scotch, and, and by the way, we're not trying to talk like we're authorities uh, we're just casual guys who, who like trying to pretend we know a little bit more than yeah, we do yeah. so that you'll, you you'll listen but to uh when in the malting process so they take barley they germinate it and then they stop the germination process and there's a lot of reasons for that and i, I won't go into all that but in scotland one of the ways they stop the germinate uh the germination process is by burning peat moss and letting that peat moss smoke, you know, it's not it's not burning at a high temperature. We're, you know, um, we're probably talking like one ten ish Fahrenheit, one fifteen ish Fahrenheit. So, and this smoke will dry out the barley, stopping the germination process. And so, if you it, they're using the peat moss that is local to the area, so the more harsher the conditions, the more the peat moss takes on those harsher flavors. So um, Isla is an island in Scotland and, you know, it's it's on the coast. And so it's buffeted by wind and salt water on a regular basis. And, and their scotch tastes like that. And it's because the peat moss that is used to dry out the barley imbues those flavors as part of the malting process. So this, this peat moss, uh, so this is a, is this Highlands? Balvini is Highlands? Um, I don't know. <laughs> so I think this is a Highland Scotch. A lot of those, the sherry ones come from that, from the same area. And I yeah. forget what that is. I want to say Space side or Highlands. Uh, I think they're real, they're real close together, but they're, uh, and it's the I Isla is the, the one that's, that's where you're going to get like Lafroig. Yeah. 
uh, you know, the that, smoke that's, bombs. Yeah, that just, yep. re- you know, Ard Beg. Those, are, yeah, those are idol scotches. Yep. And you know, there's no, uh, there's no not knowing you had some of that. Yep. I use, you know, I think the first thing that I had was something along those lines, an Isla Scotch, and it was just, it was, it was just over the top, smoky, and I just I couldn't handle it. And now, like as my palate is developing, I don't mind a little bit of that peatiness flavor, you know. And right, I, I, you just don't want it to be overwhelming. Uh, yeah, and if it is overwhelming, it's good luck having anything else the rest of the night. Like your just your palate is completely gone at that point. Like yeah. you can't come back from that. But Balconis has one called Brimstone. <laughs> I don't mind the brimstone. So okay. that one is a different type of. Well, it doesn't it, have the peatiness, but it definitely has a lot of smoky yes. and leathery flavor. I think so. the, the first time I tried that, I was out somewhere and there was a Balcones representative and he had like, you could try different things. And I tried that. And, and I my first thought was, I'm licking a leather belt. Like that's <laughs> yeah, what it tastes. Yeah. But like in a good way. <laughs> right, sure. Like, no, I don't no, know. No, it's, it's the part of the shoe that it. you're licking that tastes good. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Or whatever you say. Anyway, that's it. that's it for probably it for our whiskeys today. Um, what is our what is our topic of? Uh, I, I think we're going to talk a little bit about uh, creationism, um, the the idea of of the biblical account of creation. How literal is it? What timelines should be associated with it? All right. Uh, and and for full disclosure, uh, Jason is a media guy. Uh, he, he has an educational background in in production, right? Yeah. Okay. AV production. Radio, television. Okay. Yep. And and I am a a science guy. I have an educational background in uh, in science. I took a lot of biology, chemistry, and physics in college, specifically so that I could use it to teach. So. Uh, so, so we're coming at it from a liberal, liberal arts perspective and a scientific perspective okay. and looking at, uh, the biblical accounts. So Should we start uh, by reading just a little bit of like the first couple of verses in Genesis for those who don't remember? Okay. Sure. Um, that sounds like, um, an interesting way to go. Yeah. Let me in case people are not sure. S- stall for time goes. here yeah. while I so, search uh, for Genesis in my, it, I always Bible. find it interesting uh, I, I am what a lot of people would consider a fundamentalist Christian. I mean, that, that word is used as a pejorative a lot of the times, but but I, I find it probably fits me. I'm a pretty conservative in general, but I think I think uh, you know fundamentalists become caricatured, yep. and there, there's a whole breadth of beliefs inside the term or the people who would be termed as fundamentalists, right? So so it'll be interesting to see. We, we actually have not talked about this. Um, on purpose. Right. I started to try and talk to Jason about this, and he shut me down. So I was like, no, save stop. It the podcast. So, so it'll be interesting to see where our perspectives lie similar and where they differ. Yeah. So go and ahead. These are the type of conversations that we would we would have over dinner. Yeah, over dinner. Anyway, we, we so this way we could ta- we'll probably finish this over dinner at some point as well, <laughs> so we don't keep you all in here for three hours. Okay, here's a, just the first couple of verses of Genesis chapter one. It's in the Bible. It's it's a book. Okay. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness covered the surface of the watery depths, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. Then God said, "Let there be light." And there was light. God saw that the light was good, and God separated from the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. There was an evening, there was a morning, one day. That was the CSB. It threw me off because I have it memorized, and probably the NIV. Right. Anyway, I was like, what is this that I'm reading? Anyway, uh, there's, that's just, and then it you know, goes on, talking about creation. So, um, yeah, so I guess we could start. There's a, a bunch of different theories, right? So, like, I grew up... Um, the only theory I knew probably most of my life was just the the typical seven day, seven literal days uh, okay. of creation. Um, but then there's also like gap theory. I think is one that people talk about where it's like, oh, it's not. It, there's a big gap of time between each day. Right. The the days represent epochs. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so uh, um, I think that's probably the second biggest that people go by. That, that's probably true. Um, and then there's the people that would say that the whole thing is just poetic i guess that um, right there's nothing literal whatsoever about it yeah that it's not trying to tell the actual story of how the earth was formed but right. it's more background and, and, yeah in fact I, i've known people that would tell you um no that that's god describing evolution uh when when he creates 
these little things and as the as the figurative days continue to go by you're talking about organisms evolving to yep. become the next stage until eventually organisms evolve to become man uh i I don't ascribe to that. I'm just yep. I'm just telling you I've I've had that conversation before. So yeah, and I'm sure there's everything in between all of those as well. But th- those are the when I think of a conversation about this passage, those are the first things that I'm I, like. Yeah. If I'm talking to someone who disagrees with me on something, they're probably falling somewhere in one of those camps for the most part. Yeah, is that fair? Yeah. Um. So what would what would what camp would you say that you would fall into? Would it be one of those or a variation of those? Uh. So. I, I may not have to put, not I, to put you in a box. I, no, it's okay. Like I, I'm okay with with being definitive, um, but I, I don't know that my answer is going to satisfy your question. So, so let me more let me start one, with so. this. Um, I think there's enough ambiguity in the passages in Genesis that that lots of things could happen, and it, they would not contradict science and or God's word. Okay, um, that's fair. And I I would say that. Uh, there's enough of the Bible in general that is sometimes poetic and sometimes literal and sometimes knowing which is which is a real challenge. Yep. So, so I would say, I believe God literally created man and woman. Okay. Uh, I think he literally created the organisms, uh, you know, one by one, if you want to look at it that way, uh, so, so as someone who who teaches physics, one of the biggest distinctions between the way we perceive God and the way he is, is that God exists outside of time. So for us, time is a linear endeavor, right? Yeah. It, it'll always go forward. It can never come back. Um, but for God, he exists in all times at the same time because he, it, you know, if if your God is not strong enough to have created time itself, then you worship something other than what I worship. Mm-hmm. So uh, since he exists outside of time, then it meant nothing for him. He could have at once and over a process created everything, right? Yeah. I mean... And and it means nothing to him from a time perspective because because time doesn't apply to him. The that's way that right. It, because it time doesn't apply to him. Yep. That's so like one of the biggest, most accepted theories on the origins of our universe is the Big Bang theory. And and I won't sit here and try to explain to you all the ins and outs, May, mainly because I haven't spent a lot of time studying all the ins and outs. But one of the biggest problems with the big bang theory, especially from people who are naturalists, naturalists is just not a good TV show. (laughs) Sorry. Continue. (laughs) I stand by that, but (laughs) that's not the big bang. It it has its moments every year in class. I like to, uh, I like to play the episode excerpts from the episode where they discuss, um, the Doppler effect (laughs) or Sheldon goes as the Doppler effect for Halloween. Uh, It's pretty funny. And I use it in physics related. So yes, it is physics. I mean, big bang theory, not the TV show, the actual theory. Yes. The actual theory, the big bang theory. One, one of the, the precursors that causes problems with it for naturalists is the idea that everything in the universe was a singularity. It was a single point that was infinitely small. It was so dense and some triggering mechanism caused this huge explosion whereby all the matter in the universe expanded outward at the speed of light. Well, for something to have caused it, uh, that's where the issue is. There had to be something outside of the universe itself to have caused that. So to me, it's one of the biggest evidence is that there must be a God. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't doubt that fact, but I'm just saying like that is a huge evidence that there yeah, must I mean, be I, a God. I, the idea, I guess, that so first of all, for this matter to exist to begin with means that it's existing somehow. So either it was created or it's eternal and the thing that happened to it, same thing, right? Like whatever caused this force to happen. So either way, you're looking at either something created this or this thing's eternal. And if whatever this thing is, is eternal, now we're getting into God territory. Yeah. Right. So 
it, yeah, I think that's a big that's and but that's one of those like you know like we talked about in a previous episode like you get to a point where you're like I don't understand how this works and then that's that's a big part of that it's 50% of the theory I right. suppose yeah yeah where it's like I don't know it's, right and, and it's never really talked about which is interesting I, but yeah and and so but that that leads me to the point that so God started time running so really to me the Genesis account is less about how literal it is literal, literal yep. it is and more about how God started time. He created space time because there was no space time before this. Everything was a singularity and he spoke it into existence. And suddenly we have this thing that Einstein later described as space time. Uh, and it's, you know, it's like a single dimension space and so, time together. So, so this may be a chicken or the egg question. Did, Time. When did time begin to exist? Then was mm -hmm. it the moment of the bang? So there was no time before then. Okay, because the universe was infinitely tiny. I mean, it it was so a singularity. I guess, I, I guess my my the well, the question that I'm I'm going for this is gonna make a noise when I do this. Um, f does time exist if there's nothing to perceive the time? Does that make sense? Oh, right. That's the old, uh, if a tree falls in the woods and no one's there to hear it, doesn't make a sound. I mean, I always I mean, hated that, but I guess you're right. That is it, what it is. It, it's <laughs> the same argument. Yeah. But so, so I would tell you that from a physics perspective, time as we know it is not an independent entity. It is known as space time. Well, if there's no space, then there's no time. Okay. And so like. Th think of it this way. We know how big the universe is because we know how long we know how long that the matter in the universe has been traveling at the speed of light. And so you can the Big Bang is the origin of time. I mean, it's not like A.D. and B.C., where where you can have negative. No, no, no. Yep. there was nothing before the Big Bang, literally nothing so if you compress the 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 time back down you get to an a, a that's right you get to zero. that's what yeah that's right so that zero is either the big bang or something well no or i mean it's, you can call it the big bang just what caused the big bang i mean yeah, and okay. so my supposition is based on my belief that there is a god and that he says he caused the big bang he he doesn't call it that yeah. but it's not like you know Moses is has been credited with writing the first five books of the Bible, right? I'm pretty sure Moses had never heard the term Big Bang. Yep. <laughs> before. Well, God said bang and it happened. That's that's the Southern Baptist Big Bang right, right there. Right. God said bang and it happened. Yeah, the, you know, and I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure Moses also didn't speak in King James English either. <laughs> so, My Moses did. <laughs> so uh you know but if you're Moses and you're trying to describe the origins of time itself, well, you describe it as, as God reveals it to you. And it makes sense that that's what he's describing. Yeah. I mean, looking back, I totally see that. So I'm less concerned with how literal that is and more understanding that God is saying, look, you either trust that I did this or you think I can't. There, there's no in between. If you think he can, but he's lying about it, that, that's kind of a foolish notion. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, if he can, why would he lie about it? <laughs> so, yeah, I, I, I'm trying to play. I, I'm trying to play devil's advocate for the people who are like listening to this and screaming because they're holding to one of these. That's right. not what I think. You right. know, like, um, I guess so. The the kickback to that would be well. Well, let me let me back up. I, I I think that all scripture is breathed by God and useful for teaching, correcting, and training in righteousness. Right? Yes. I I so, so I, we come from the same point of view on that. Yeah. So okay. so I I believe scripture is inerrant. Now, what that to me meant growing up was that well, if you don't believe that that was seven twenty four hour days, then you know, right. Then you don't believe the Bible's inerrant. Right. When which I probably would have said that fifteen years ago. Right. And now I'm realizing, well, the Bible is inerrant in what it's trying to communicate, right? So, like, there is, <laughs> there is, we don't know exactly 
what it means by a day. Now, I think it, it right. does mean it's. I, I think it does okay. mean a twenty four hour day, right? Okay. Um, I think the the rest. Whenever you see day throughout the next half of Genesis, it's always translated as a twenty four hour period, right? So I I think it's a stretch to say that's not what this is. Um, but that being said, I don't know that that is necessarily what's trying to be communicated that it's super important that this is a 24 hour day. Right. right. Um, anyway, so that, that's, that's kind of where I was coming at. Like yeah. it, it, it really doesn't matter. Yeah. It, it doesn't matter if it's a 24 hour day and, and for folks, I mean, I know there's lots of folks that get caught up on both sides of that argument yep. and they want, you know, well, science proves, well, God said and it. It's like, okay, I, you know, I think you're, you're missing the point. Yeah, I think yeah, we can often get sidetracked by trying to get details that that maybe yeah, are less important. You want to know, right? Yeah. Well, let me give let me give uh, so where you know where I stand now with, with the creation topic. So okay. I read a book um, a couple of years ago by a guy named uh, John John Salehammer. Is that right? I don't yeah. know. You're telling John the story. Salehammer. Yeah. Okay. I had Thank to you. Google it. Real no quick. problem. I pre googled it and pulled it up. That's a pre Google. Um, so again, I just kind of gave away, showed my cards there a little bit. Uh, I think that it is talking about twenty-four hour periods when it says day. Okay. I think it's, I think it's a stretch to say that that means anything but that, based off of how we translate day throughout the rest of Genesis. Genesis. Right now, people say, "Oh, you know, God says with the day with Him is like you know a thousand years, whatever." Okay, but that's not right. It's not what we're talking about. This is, we're talking about the context of Moses writing Genesis. Right. We see the word day, it means a 24-hour period. Um, so I think it's a stretch to say it's anything but that, unless you're coming at it from another direction, trying to explain it from another way. So this book, uh, Genesis Unbound by John Seal Hammer, uh, was a really interesting book. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So his, his theory, which I'm not going to say that I totally hold to this, but uh, it's the strongest the strongest theory that I've heard yet. Okay. Um, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That was the beginning, right? That was the big bang, so to speak. Right. Right. So yep. that happens. Then unspecified amount of time. Yes. Could have been five minutes. Could have been billions of years. We have no idea. Right. Then verse two happens. Now the earth was formless and empty, right? Cause it was already created. The heavens and the earth were already created. Now it was for formless and empty. Darkness covered the surface of the watery depths. Spirit of God was hovering over the surface. So what his his argument is that God created the heavens and the earth, and then in some unspecified time later, he decided, now let me um, put order to these things, right? And so then as he goes through the, the different days, I think they are 24-hour days, right, where God is not forming the Grand Canyon. So in 20, a tw 24 hour days from whose perspective? From our perspective, right? For, okay. From the perspective of the author, uh, for, you know, writing so, Genesis. So you're saying that like the Big Bang happens and within 24 hours, he's formed Earth itself. No, no, no. I'm saying in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So that right, is that, God. That that's is, the Big Bang, right? I mean, sh maybe. Sure. Okay. I, I have right, a degree in radio enough. television. Uh, Whatever it is, right? Big okay. Bang, sure. Um, God creates the heavens and the earth. So that could be, that could take him five minutes. That could take him a million years, right? right. I don't know. But then the earth was formless and, and empty. So he saw that. So Grand Canyon has been created unspecified amount of time previously, right? And now God is giving order to these things that, that he's already created. So... Um, and without going, you know, chapter by chapter into the book, that that's the idea is that, so when we see things in the world that seem to suggest that this was millions of years ago, it very well could have been, right? Because if, if God created in the beginning, whenever the beginning is, Big Bang, God created the heavens and the earth, now the earth was formless and empty. There wasn't, right. it, you know, so he goes through and he mows the lawn, essentially. Like, that's what I think of it. Sure. He starts gardening, essentially. And the point of it all is that that points us it's really interesting how it points to Christ because when he is creating the garden of Eden, it's a, uh, it's a look towards Jerusalem and the new Jerusalem and new heavens and new earth. Right. right? So it's like he creates this and then he gives it meaning and order. And he, anyway, right. Um, 
So I th- that's an interesting thing because it does still fit what we think of as a 24 hour period, because I, th- I think that the author is trying to, sh- to say that, yes, this is a 24 hour period by using that, whether by using that day in that term, the w- in the way that he uses it sure. everywhere else. I understand what you're saying. Um, so anyway, I think it, it, it's interesting because it's a, it kind of gets the best of both worlds. I think a lot of times people will look at, they'll, they'll look at, you know, um, modern science and then they'll read that into scripture instead of letting scripture speak for itself. Yeah. Now I think there's people who still read this and they don't hold the theory that I hold and they get to the, you know, a day is an epoch type of thing. Right. Right. And I think they, they are truly reading that from the text. And as long as they're using starting with scripture, I'm okay with that. Right. I don't think that's necessarily true, but I see where they're coming from. Does that make sense? Um, anyway, Genesis Unbound is a really good book. Uh, it's been a couple of years since I read it. I might want okay. to read it again. Um, but especially the way that he ties it, he ties the Garden of Eden into uh, the New Jerusalem. It's a, it's a, I got it's you. pretty cool. So, so I, I just want to clarify. So he's approaching it from a spiritual perspective, from a translational perspective, like interpreting the way Moses used the rest of his words interpreting what he means and less from a scientific perspective. Yeah. And I don't think he goes into the 24 hour day thing near as much. I I think, I think he does say that he thinks that's a typical day that we think of it as Okay, Uh, that I'm, I'm putting that into it from what I know about studying this in the past of how, when we see the word day in Genesis, at least the next 30 chapters or whatever, it's always translated as a 24 hour day. So that's not to say that that means it has to be that way here. Right. But it does seem to suggest that that would be the case. uh, all right, so so let's let, let me kind of backtrack for a moment. Um, I, I I I believe that that the laws of physics that we know were set up by God. Like God set these into motion and set these laws so that we could then interpret nature according to the way He's created it. Okay. Okay. And, and so what what I mean by that is, <laughs> you know, not, not that I have to worry about this from you, but. But obviously, if if the laws of physics prove the Earth is round, then it's definitely not flat, right? Okay. Yep. I mean, I teach high school students, folks, so uh, and they this have is YouTube, an argument, so. unfortunately, that I have to have a few times a year. Um, where was I going with that? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, are you aware that that it wasn't that long ago that, that our day became 24 hours? In other words, it wasn't always 24 hours. Really, the Earth is slowing down. Yes. So okay, but we're talking like minuscule amounts. We're not talking like. Uh, I'm pretty sure that you can go far enough back to find an 18 hour day. Okay. So, I mean, okay, so, but we're so not talking I, like five minutes to 24 hours. Right. No. Okay. Like yeah. the sun isn't like right coming up and then boom. Well, I mean, y- at some point, at some point, probably the Earth rotated in five minutes, but it was because it was formless. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was because okay. oh that's you know, interesting yeah so, okay. so so i say that not to not to refute your idea just to say that your idea has to have nuance because because there were definitely times where one rotation of the earth was not 24 hours yeah i guess i'm coming from the perspective of the author writing this right which wouldn't sure. have been millions of years ago right? no 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 well, like, but, but my well, point is how does god imbue to moses what time period we're talking about here. I I don't think he does. I think that's, but I mean, theoretically the big bang happened so fast that, you know, the, the earth could have formed really quickly and you know it, it could have spun around really fast. And God created all this stuff in like, in like 10 hours. And and it would it could still potentially conform to the literal day. There was there was what is it? There was evening and then morning and the next day, or uh, I don't yeah. remember the exact phrase. Well, yeah, and then you and then you move from just you move into animals, and and, and that's where you get that, the, that, the evolution. That's what I mean, though. Stuff, he right. he could have done this stuff so fast. Yeah, because and I go back to my previous point. God exists outside of time. So so anyway. Uh, my main point is I, I think I think focusing on how literal that is is not the point. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. The I best think- argument I, f- I feel like I have 
is with folks that that say they know modern science has to be wrong because you know the dinosaurs can't the, you can't have dinosaurs and also have the biblical creation would you ascribe to that or no but it, it depends how you define biblical creation i guess i mean i mean the account of genesis has to be wrong if dinosaurs are real do you do you feel well, that? But it depends how you are interpreting Genesis one. So no, I mean I <laughs> okay. Yeah. So so you're saying there is leeway in Genesis for the dinosaurs to exist. Yeah. I, okay. Side side note, I just found so evidently there's people who think that dinosaurs weren't real. That's right. And I just found that out. Yes. From someone. Yes. Like six months ago. Yeah. And like. I and they have a, a whole joke. Facebook group, group. and, well, they, and okay, it says in their description, this is not a joke. We honestly do not believe dinosaurs Which is what real. makes it feel like a joke. But anyway, this person I was talking with grew up thinking like that was just, that was like what they were taught that about growing the flat up. earthers, by the way. No, I, no, I, I legit thought that too. That I it was just a, but right, it's a this troll. person like growing up before Facebook, like they were, they were told that, or maybe they just assumed, I don't know, that the dinosaurs, dinosaurs aren't real. The dinosaurs aren't real. And like, it kind of just blew my mind. It opened up a like, oh, okay. Anyway, that's not the point. Um, <laughs> yes, I think dinosaurs are real. <laughs> I don't think the earth is flat. Um, but yeah, I mean, your interpretation of Genesis 1, I guess, is going to define whether you can say that or not. I don't know. I mean. Uh, I, and so I would say, irregardless of your interpretation. If So so here's my, my issue with people on both sides of the creation debate if there is such a thing when you try to pigeonhole evidence into one argument or the other at the end of the day what you're really doing is serving yourself and trying to make your opinion valid and that's not the point of genesis in fact the point of the whole bible is to recognize you're so nothing that your opinion really doesn't matter (laughs) yeah i think that's that's a really good point is you know this is this is true of the end times conversation the conversation on creationism a bunch of things is like this is not about us and my like this is not right. genesis one is not about me and trying to get things right so i can pat myself on the back right and like most of the time that's what those conversations turn into right so real quick question about uh just a total recap so is the earth what what is the number seven thousand years old or 350 million or oh, somewhere so, in between. So about four billion is what I would say the Earth is. Around four billion years old. The universe is that, or, or no, the no, Earth? No, the universe is probably. So I don't remember. I have no I, I'd have to go. This, so. uh, it's it's somewhere between thirteen billion and seventeen billion years old. I think is the estimated uh, age of the universe. Okay. And the Earth is estimated and this this is based on physics i mean like so this is not just some people making up stuff but you called yourself a fundamentalist at the beginning of this i i I am a fundamentalist and by that i mean that that i think i think everything in the universe was created when god willed it to be created right i think all i think all christians would say that to be true okay that's fair i think maybe time out tell me if i'm wrong so what you mean is you think all christians who actually follow the prescripts of Christ. But I think there's a lot of people that call themselves Christian that, I mean, and, and I'm not trying to judge anybody. I'm just saying like, there's definitely a cultural component to all religious practice. And some people are culturally yes, yep. uh, associated with a religion, but not, that's true. Not faith. I would say anyone wise. who, anyone who has ever, anyone who, who says they've, they've read scripture and, and hold to it, even in a non errant way, I think, most of those people would say, yeah, that God did this thing. Now, how okay. he did it, maybe it was the Big Bang, maybe it was the evolution, sure, sure, maybe sure. all these things, whatever. Right. So, but when I when I hear fundamentalist about the creationism thing, that means the Earth is seven thousand years old or ten thousand, yeah, whatever okay. it is, so, and like, yeah. So I I, I don't. How, how long were Adam and Eve in the garden before they they committed sin? I guess we don't know, but uh, no, no, it no, seems no, like they, a week. That, that's just it. I don't no, know. No. It seems like Hold a week, on. but that's because the way the story right. reads out. Well, I, I have mean, no idea. Like, just imagine, like, they were like children in many ways uh, in terms of their own um, realization of what life was. Yep. And they, they could have been there for millions of years. Yeah, maybe. That seems like a long time. 
you know, it depends when the serpent shows up to start tempting him. Like, it seems like that's a sure. long time to, it feels like. Well, to, how literal if it is was that? Li- okay, how li- fair you enough. Know, Maybe that's for another podcast. You know, but. like, yeah, it, it definitely is. But, but there's my point. My point is there's enough ambiguity that, that lots of stuff could happen and we'll never know, <laughs> yep. you know, there, there's not going to be scientific evidence to prove the Bible wrong. And there's not going to be scientific evidence to prove the Bible right, because the Bible is not designed to prove. The Bible is designed for you to believe like God will prove it in your heart with his spirit, but not, you know, like if you're waiting for him to to like write it down and put it on a spreadsheet so you can see it, then, yep. you know, I, I feel like that that's that's a fool's errand. Yep. So 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 that's my whole point about all of this. I. I think he calls us to trust him when he tells us how he did things and in the areas, you know, we, we talked not too long ago about uh, Calvinism and, and in that discussion, we talked about the mystery inherent in salvation. Right. And we, we don't really know, right. We, we don't understand it fully. We, we have some grasp of it, of where it comes from, but we don't, we don't really understand it, and I would say this is the same. Yeah, I think the bi- the biggest thing for me uh, is, is, especially when reading this book, growing up the way that I did, thinking about the creation thing, I I would always just immediately discount people who would say that like uh, that God used evolution or God used the Big Bang or whatever. I'd be like, you don't you don't even read your Bible, you know? Like, <laughs> what are you even talking about? Um, Whereas now, like uh, after reading this this book, which made me, it challenged a lot of my assumptions, right? right? And I was like, oh, and this guy's doing it from scripture. So like, maybe it's not, th- maybe these people are reading scripture and they really are getting to this point truly. Like, right. That's totally different than what I'm just assuming that like, right. oh, well, this is what I think. And now let me make the Bible say this, right? And so it, I think that's really what this comes down to is it, in things like this, we got to go back to scripture to see what scripture says. Right. And then the hard part of that is taking out what we've been taught growing up in our culture or just in a, in our Sunday school classes that may or may not, it could have just been one person taking out the traditions exactly that are not necessarily biblically based. Yep. They can help inform the way you think about things, but they should, but, we should be, I keep pointing my phone, we should be going back to scripture ultimately, right. which is what this book made me do instead of like, I just assumed I knew what all these things meant. It was easy. And then I was like, wait a second. In the beginning, God's created, God created the heavens and the earth. And then he does something like, wait, that there could be a giant time frame between that. That's like right. that's a possibility. It could be. It's yep. not, not guaranteed. That's what that's it is. That's right. But like that opened up the door for, oh, wait a second. Right. Maybe this isn't just, maybe I don't have this all figured I, out. I mean, I think. I think that is the key, right? Is the willingness to recognize maybe we don't understand it all and to continue to seek um, his his interpretation. Yep. Not not the one we've always been taught yep. or the one that, you know, like, well, I've always fought against those people. And so now I'd look like a real idiot yeah. if I turned you tail. Are, you are not your ideas, right? Like, I mean, if yeah, that's... That's the age-old problem: is we get attached to the things that we yeah. think, and then we can't. Even when we know we're wrong on something, we like I can't let everybody know that I'm right. wrong. Right. So and, and, and so you know, from that perspective, I'm 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 happy to find out that I'm I'm missing the boat on this. Um, yeah. If and, our ultimate goal is to understand that's right. scripture better and then align to it, then we should be okay with having these conversations. That's right. Where we have our beliefs challenged. And, yeah. and also recognize that. At the end of the day, probably neither one of us have a real good handle <laughs> on any of this. Yeah, none of us are going to be a hundred percent right in everything, which is why you should and, sit down and have conversations like this to challenge your your beliefs. I I think this was a good one. Huh? I think it was too. All right. Well, uh, you know, I, I'm not sure what else we can say other than thanks for joining us. Uh, I hope uh, I hope we spurred some uh, some interesting thoughts on. You know Genesis and creation and that kind of thing. And, and uh, this this Balvini was created in literally fifteen <laughs> literal years <laughs> in literal sherry casks. Yeah, I mean, yes, that's true. Uh, you should you should go find a bottle, try it. And, and if you have a problem with us drinking whiskey and then talking about this stuff, you should look look at our previous episode where we talked about how Jesus actually made intoxicating wines. So, yep. uh, and then you could. Sh- 
click the subscribe button. That's right. Make sure you subscribe. And we'll uh, make you mad next week, The too. only way we're going to get sponsored by a whiskey place is if we have lots of subscriptions. Yep. So. Or yeah. maybe we can get some free Bibles or something. That Oh, that would be good, too. We yeah, should both sides should of this. look out to Lifeway, maybe. Yeah. All right. Lifeway. Let us know. <laughs> All right. We'll see you all next time. Yep. Thanks a lot, guys. Deal with the spirit.